a lot of things going on uh, in the world and uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, speaking to you about how it all relates to investing. So um, I'm going to do something a little bit different from what normally uh, you hear when somebody talks about politics. My job is not to say what should happen. My job is not even to say really what will happen. My job is to say how what I think will happen will impact the markets. So there are no normative or ideological or value uh, or values assigned to my views. This is purely focused on how politics will impact the markets. Um, and at BCA Research, I mean, that is ultimately the, uh, uh, built into our DNA. Uh, we're a macroeconomic research shop that has focused on economics for, uh, as Marshall said, almost 70 years. We were founded in 1949 in Montreal and we've stayed in the city. We're one of the uh, few financial institutions that didn't move out of the city due to political instability there. Uh, the joke, of course, is that Bank of Montreal is not headquartered in Montreal. It's headquartered in Toronto. So uh, <coughs> we, we stayed uh, in Montreal for a very long time. And throughout this uh, seven decade period, we have never really um, focused on politics systematically. We, you know, if you read our archives from the 60s and 70s, you'll come upon uh, research that mentions Vietnam War, Watergate, things like this, but only in ancillary way. So we have never really focused uh, systematically on politics, and that's because we didn't really fel feel the need to do so in order to do our job. After 2008, that changed, and the firm hired me out of a shop called Stratfor, based in uh, US, in, in Austin, Texas, uh, which was purely a political shop. It didn't really uh, focus too much on the economics and investing. And so I tried to marry the two approaches, the political analysis and, um, and investment research. Now, um, there is a, there's a view, there's a tendency for investors to say, wow, politics really matters a lot today. It hasn't really mattered like this in a long time. But this is actually false. Politics has always mattered. It just worked in the favor of the professional investor. And what I mean by that is that um, from about 1980s to 2010, roughly speaking, I would say that politics and geopolitics was a tailwind to investors for two reasons. First, on the geopolitical front, the United States was a clear hegemon. In 1985, famously, Mikhail Gorbachev made a speech in uh, Leningrad then, St. Petersburg today, and he said basically, look, the jig is up. We got to reform. And the United States just went through a phase where overall and empirically measurable geopolitical power of the U.S. ascended basically a status of a global hegemon. So from uh, a sense of international politics, investors just didn't really care what was going on. Sure, there were occasional important events, like for example, China joining the WTO in 2001. There was September 11th as a terrorist attack. There was, of course, the Desert Storm, the first that did I increase oil prices temporarily. But these were not paradigm shifting events. And so for the most part, really, investors didn't have to worry about geopolitics. On the political front, something even more important happened in the 1980s. See, in the 1980s, there was a big conflict <coughs> between two approaches to economics. There was the Francois Mitterrand, Keynesian approach in France, where he basically became the president and tried to uh, nationalize industry, banks. He tried to move towards more Keynesian policies. And the franc devalued three times, and France almost went hat in hand to the IMF because of it, forcing him to reverse within two years, 180 degree turn. Meanwhile, the Reagan-Thatcher revolution won. It proved that supply-side economics at the time were the correct choice. And this was a very important ideological battle because it decided the next 30 years of domestic politics. And what happened was, the success of Reagan and Thatcher in, ter in terms of policy, but also in terms of political outcomes, in terms of them getting reelected over and over again, illustrated to policymakers across the world that moving to the center right on economics was the right thing to do. That the median voter had moved to the center right on economic policy. What do I mean by that? I mean, you know, conservative fiscal policy, low taxes, generally deregulation, and free trade. Those we became universal truths, not only abided by the sort of pro-business center-right conservative parties, but even the formerly social democratic parties. So you had a number of policymakers on the left, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, Paul Keating in Australia, uh, Jean Chrétien in Canada, um, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, 
a number of policymakers on the left moved to the center right on economic affairs. So you had two big trends, American empire and the dominance of supply side, Washington consensus, neoliberal economic policies. And this lasted for 30 years. So that's why you didn't have to show up at 8 a.m. in Bedford and listen to a political analyst no. talk to you about equities. <laughs> Not because politics didn't exist as a factor, but because it was a tailwind. Now, I think that this is a permanent paradigm shift, of course, self-servedly, right? Uh, but genuinely, I do believe that we are in a, in, in, a, in a world where there's a lot of paradigm shifts, both geopolitically, where U.S. empire is in a decline, not because anyone messed up. It's not Obama's fault, it's not Bush's fault, it's a structural decline that I'll explain empirically. Uh, and it's going to present challenges on the geopolitical front, but also on the domestic front, that consensus that center-right economic policies were the right way to go is broken. And we're going to have a lot of interesting experimentation going on. You know, whether it's Donald Trump, who is running the center-right pro-business party, some of his policies may be very pro-business, some of them might not be. And then you have, of course, the Democratic Party, which is struggling with this fight between the very far left and the more centrist wings. And we saw that yet last night with some, you know, openly socialist candidates winning the primaries. So it's a very interesting world that we're living in. And I think that you can no longer run a macro strategy or a macro shop like we did without having a systematic approach to politics. So how are we systematic about politics? Um, what, is, what does that mean? You know, how can you uh, focus on politics in an objective, empirical Away. Well, there's, there's a few things that we focus on. First of all, we're data-driven, and as you'll see, there's going to be a lot of data in this presentation. There's going to be a lot of charts. Um, and you can be data-driven. There's this myth out there that, that political data is bad. You know, well, well, polls didn't predict Trump. Polls got Brexit wrong, and this is just false. Polls showed that Hillary Clinton was going to win the national vote by 2.1%, and she won the national vote by 2.1%. It's not the fault of the pollsters that the pundits then took that information and ran with it and said, oh, there's no chance Trump wins. Or, as Nate Silver, the sort of doyen of American statistical analysis said, he's got a good 35% chance, and I was right because I said 35, everybody else said 20. Well, I mean, great, but the correct call for that election was too close to call. Actually, 2.1% lead in the national polls is the margin of error. Uh, a lot more humility should have been taken in looking at the data. The data actually said what happened. The data said that there was a chance for President Trump to win. There was a path to victory. And we outlined it to clients in our research ahead of the, uh, ahead of the vote. Same with Brexit. Brexit was a very close call. The polls were showing that, that it was basically, again, within the margin of victory. And the way that we use data uh, in politics to give an investment story from politics is it's not that we try to forecast what's going to happen. So on Brexit, let me use that example, uh, I actually got Brexit wrong. I said my view was it was too close to call. And if you put a gun to my head, as I wrote in a note before Brexit, I would say Remain will win. However, according to the performance of the pound and according to the betting market in London, you know, you can bet on anything in London. It's like a wild, wild world there. The bookies, the combination of odds, presented by bookies, and the pound told me that the probability of Brexit priced by the market was 20 to 30 percent. My view was that it was closer to 50, 50-50. So what we did is we recommended to clients to protect themselves against Brexit by shorting the pound, by going long FTSE 100, which would benefit if the pound fell, short FTSE 250, and overweighing industrials, which would benefit from a cheap pound, and underweighing financials. All three of those trades, views, basically knocked it out of the ballpark. Even though my view was that Bramain would probably ultimately win. So that tells you something about our approach. We're not trying to predict who wins the game, we're betting against the spread. Right, it's like sports betting. It's not about who wins the game. I couldn't care less who wins or loses in politics. It's not my job. It's about who covers the spread. So that's the first thing. Data-driven, probabilistic, and most importantly, when you think about how to, uh, to uh, predict policymakers, when, when it's time to actually make a call, what we rely on is a view that focusing on preferences of policymakers, what does Donald Trump want, what does Angela Merkel want, what does Vladimir Putin want, 
That, is, that has very little value. I certainly have no insights into these issues. And the people I talk to, uh, my sources, quote unquote, they don't have any insights either. Most people will be selling their book. Any political analyst that comes in front of you and starts name dropping, that's uh, snake juice. And the reason I say that is not that they don't have genuine sources, it's not that. It's that it is very difficult for anyone in a private enterprise to have statistically significant amount of source intelligence-based information. The only folks who can have statistically significant amount of intelligence are the intelligence agencies. And if they're telling you anything, they're probably committing treason. Right? So the only way to really think about politics in our position, where we don't have access to human intelligence, signals intelligence, and electronic intelligence, the sort of three foundations of the intelligence collections agencies, the only way to have insight is to focus on constraints. Constraints to policymakers are material. They're in the real world. They can be constitutional, they can be legal, they can be economic, financial, military, political. So take, for example, trade war. Right after Donald Trump was elected on November 30th, 2016, so several weeks after his election, we wrote an analysis that said that trade war would ultimately be the key risk of his presidency. I mean, it looked like a bad call for most of 2017 because nothing really happened on that front. There was, of course, the Mar-a-Lago summit when he and Xi Jinping had a big chocolate cake and everything looked good. <laughs> and we kind of told clients, yeah, that's, that's just a chocolate cake speaking. You know, these guys are going to get into trouble. And the way we made that call was not by focusing on Trump's preferences, the idea that he's a negotiator, that he's a business guy, that he makes deals done. We focused on the fact that there were basically no constraints to American president when he came to being very aggressive on protectionist policy. What do I mean by that? Well, Constitution of the United States of America gives Congress complete power over trade. Complete. However, Congress has given this up over the last 60 years through several legislative acts where Congress has basically given away its constitutional prerogative and given the executive the power to completely regulate trade. So first and foremost, there are no legal reasons that Trump can't do whatever he wants. Now, he can be sued, but as previous court cases have proven, including in 1972, when Nixon in 1971 put a 10% sur surcharge on all imports, he was actually sued by a Japanese zipper company in 72. And there might be lawyers here, so I'm throwing this narrative in there. It might be interesting. But in 1972, he was sued. A uh, Japanese zipper company said, you can't just put a tariff on us. And the administration used an interesting argument to the Supreme Court. They argued that because of national security reasons, they could do anything. There was a national emergency. And when the Supreme Court, well, what emergency is it, when they asked, they said, well, the Korean War is still going on. In 1972. Well, no, I mean, it hadn't been going on. But the Supreme Court is not going to go against the prerogative of the president when it comes to national security issues. When it comes to national security issues, Supreme Court, if that clause is brought up, is pretty much going to accept it. So my point is, a succession of legislative acts by Congress has given over power over trade. Furthermore, uh, when you think about economic constraints to protectionism, I think this is overstated. U.S. exports as percent of GDP is 8%, 8%, very, very low, lowest of any major economy in the world. U.S. can play the trade war with minimal impact domestically. Finally, political constraint. What will happen when Walmart prices go up? What will happen when all those millions of soybean farmers, sarcasm, rise up with their pitchforks and, and you know, like, assault the, uh, the White House? Well, a, as you can tell, I'm, I'm making fun of this argument. It's, it's ridiculous. Donald Trump won because he promised the $40 an hour job back. You know, American people, if they believe that story, if they, if they believe that can happen, they will give up T-shirts, toasters, and toys being like 10, 15% more expensive. It's okay. You'll let that happen. You will even stomach a 20% decline in your equities because you don't have any equities. I mean, this is an important point. Right? So, so, so there is not going to be a revolt against Trump's protectionism. Anyways, we put this together in a report basically 18 months ago and we said, based on our constraint-based analysis, we think there is going to be a trade war. What Trump's preferences are, we don't know. That's volatile, that's ephemeral, we can't get into his head. But as investors, we focus on what we can measure. 
and what we can measure is investment relevant. Why? Because policymaker preferences are optional and subject to constraints, whereas constraints are neither optional nor subject to preferences. So what do you want to focus on? Preferences or constraints? Okay, so let's talk about um, you know, some investment relevant political issues. And I want to start off with some boring stuff. I know you came here and you're thinking about trade wars, you're thinking about Iran, you're thinking about North Korea, you're thinking I'm going to talk about those really you know, interesting issues, and I will. But I want to start with something really boring. I want to start off with domestic politics in both US and China. Because in our assessment, this is the most investment relevant. So when I talk about domestic politics in the US, what I really mean is the shock, the absolute shock that the investment community has been uh, dealt with, that Donald Trump got what he wanted. Let me, say, uh, let me explain what I mean. When Donald Trump was elected, there was the sort of a Trump, uh, the Trump trade. The Trump trade was dollar up, yields up, equities up, everything up. Uh, so basically bonds sold off, uh, equities went up, the dollar went up. Now this dissipated after March of 2017 for two reasons. One, inflation data wasn't very clear. It, it was pretty tepid. But second of all, Obamacare failed. And a lot of my clients, a lot of my clients, both conservatives and Democrats uh, in the US, whether on the coast or the Midwest, became sort of depressed about the Trump reflation trade because once Obamacare failed, there was this sense that, well, if they can't get that through Congress, which is Republican held, what else can they get? And this was a very, very bad political analysis by the investment community. Basically, investors assigned conditional probability, a conditional relationship between Obamacare and stimulus, which is of course nonsense. Ta reforming Obamacare means taking entitlements away from people. Stimulus means giving people candy. <laughs> it is much more difficult to take entitlements away from, from, from voters. It's much easier to do stimulus and tax cuts. And so we never wavered in our view that there was going to be what I call profligate tax cuts. Now, nobody agreed with this. My Democratic client said, no way, Trump is stupid. He can't get it done. My conservative client said, no, he will do it, but it'll be revenue neutral. Because I'm a fiscal conservative, and so I want it to be revenue neutral. Well, folks, both were wrong. It happened, and oh boy, was it not revenue neutral. I mean, it blew a hole in the budget like you wouldn't believe. And then on top of that, you have this short government shutdown right, in January, very short, brief, and then what happens? Boom, they agree to a two-year plan to blow out the budget deficit even further. They move, remove the sequesters, and we have a two-year deal um, that's, that's basically fiscal stimulus. And so this chart shows you the consequence of these moves in the U.S. You have a very, very simple chart. The red line is the fiscal deficit as percent of GDP. The blue line is unemployment. As you can see, the unemployment rate and fiscal deficits move in tandem. Why? Well, because uh, when unemployment rate starts going up, it's usually because we have a recession. And when that happens, usually fiscal deficits go up because automatic stabilizers, like unemployment insurance, one of them, usually uh, start costing more money. Now, it is very rare that something like this happens, where unemployment rate keeps going down while budget deficits go up. And that's what's going to happen over the next two years, provided that this budget deal continues to go where it is. The reason it doesn't happen often is because, and I mean this subjectively and non-ideologically, because it's stupid. <laughs> you do not stimulate at the end of the economic cycle. There's no need. You're at the top of the economic cycle. There's no need to stimulate. The economy is doing great. Um, but that's what we got in the US. And it was very important to forecast that this would happen because uh, it's something that the bond market really wasn't flagging. So earlier this year, we had this big move in bond yields to 3%, basically I would argue because of this. The data also was very positive, but it was interesting because last year there were moments when data was good as well, and all you got from my clients was as uh, one of the questions was last night, all you got from clients was AI, robots, Amazon. No, 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 but in unemployment rate is low, there'll be inflation, nope. Nope, AI, robots, Amazon. And today, I don't hear that a lot, except last night. <laughs> you don't get that anymore. One of the reasons is, I think investors are starting to price this in. They're pricing in profligacy. They're pricing in the fact that we've got a Republican president, we've got a Republican held Congress, and we're just spending. <laughs> we're spending like drunken sailors. Again, non-normative, that's just a fact. Now, 
What does this mean for investors? What does this mean for assets? Well, you could make an argument this is very bearish dollar. You know, we're going to have twin deficits, both the, uh, both the trade balance and, and budget deficits are going to expand. So shouldn't that be bad for the dollar? And certainly there were periods of time when something like this, profligacy, has been bad for the dollar. For example, during the uh, Bush Jr. years, we had a war in Iraq, we had tax cuts, dollar collapsed. But it's not because of this policy. You have to put American policy into context. And so what we did 18 months ago is we sat there and we said, okay, we've got one forecast. We have a forecast that Trump will get his way on fiscal policy, that he will get his way on tax cuts. But in order to make an asset allocation decision, you have to kind of then compare what's going on in the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is not doing this. The rest of the world, led by China, which is really the other side of the coin, there's the US and China, what China is doing is the exact opposite. They're doing counter-cyclical policy. So the Chinese policymakers basically decided that the gro global growth resynchronization, which was sort of the story in the investment community last year, global growth is finally synchronized. Finally, everyone's growing. This was late 2016, all of last year. Chinese policymakers took that view. They agreed with it and said, OK, finally time for us to do some painful structural reforms. And so all throughout last year, we focused on domestic politics in China. And we argued to our clients before data proved anything, before we had data to prove it, that policymakers in Beijing would use this global growth synchronization to tinker with their financial system, which is bloated, full of uh, bad debt. And basically, they surged $10 trillion of liquidity into their system over the last six years. And there is no financial system on the planet that can uh, successfully digest $10 trillion in six years. Certainly not China. I mean, if the United States of America has a bubble every 10 years, if we, in the United States, a 200-year-old financial system, most sophisticated, most liquid, if we mess up once every 10 years, there's been a lot of misallocation of capital in China. The Chinese policymakers are not stupid. They know this. So they're trying to, instead of having a bubble burst, they're doing something really smart. They're trying to reform the financial system. But that means downside risks. And so we flagged that this last year. And as you can see from the data, it is starting to articulate itself in the data. On the left side is our leading indicator. So this is a leading indicator we use to predict the Li Keqiang Index. What is the Li Keqiang Index? Well, Li Keqiang is the premier of China. And in a WikiLeaks <coughs> leak, he was revealed to have said that he doesn't believe the GDP figures of his own country. So he has this measure he designed himself. <laughs> this is quite funny because a lot of investors use it. They don't know where it actually comes from. It comes from <laughs> leaks. Like Lee Ketchung didn't say this openly. You know, he didn't have a podium and say, well, this is what I use. No, no, he said privately, like, our GDP data is complete, you know, BS. So here's what I use. So everybody else uses it. Now, we tried to use six different indicators to predict that indicator. And as you can see from this chart, basically <laughs> all six of our indicators are essentially negative. And we expect more downside over the next six months from the Chinese economy, including, and most importantly, because you don't really care about GDP growth as an investor based in New Hampshire, you care about their imports. Because what you're buying are those assets that are leveraged to, to Chinese imports. And they're coming down as well, both in renminbi terms and in US terms. In fact, uh, the renminbi is also depreciating right now. They're using that to fight the trade war with Trump. So there's a lot more downside, we think, in China. Now, when you put all of these uh, kind of uh, views together, you have a very clear view of the world in at least 2018. America is stimulating. Politics is stimulative to the U.S. economy right now. That's a fact. Politics is stimulative to growth. And I think that Trump is going to get and meet his targets of GDP growth. Uh, a lot of people don't like that because they don't like Trump, but this is just a fact. He's the US president, he's got a Congress behind him, and they're focused on generating nominal GDP growth. They're gonna get it. In China, policymakers are doing something else. And they're really committed to this, by the way, because they're afraid of the next 10 years. Why are Chinese policymakers doing reforms today? Because of two reasons. First of all, they genuinely believe that if they don't reform, they're going to fall in what's called the middle income trap. Now, this chart here might be the most important chart, I think, of the decade. And it tries to visualize this concept of the middle income trap. Now, let me explain here. The x-axis is GDP per capita as percent of US GDP per capita. So as percent of US. 
And then the x-axis is growth. And then we show East Asia and Latin America. East Asia is the dark chart. From 1955 to 2017, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, which is what we call East Asia in this chart, went from 20% of US GDP to 80%. They escaped the middle income trap. Latin America, as you can see from 1955 to 2017, is spinning around in circle. It's like a wheel stuck in the snow and there's no four wheel drive, right? So it's just spinning in circle. Now the reason this is important is because there's different political outcomes of these two trajectories. East Asian economies were very peaceful domestically, very, very socially peaceful. There were only two revolutions during this period in South Korea and in Taiwan, both in 1987. They became democracies, but these were peaceful revolutions, you know, more or less, right before the Seoul Olympics, they transitioned into multi-party democracies. Latin America, there was a coup every Friday. So, <laughs> what, what we are arguing is that Chinese policymakers are extremely aware of this concept. In fact, the sort of economic muse of President Xi Jinping, his name is Liu He, he translated this concept into China. That's his like, claim to fame in China. And the Chinese policymakers, as you can see, China is at a very interesting trajectory point here. It can either go alongside its East Asian peers, or it can swing back and become a giant Asian Brazil. If it becomes a giant Asian Brazil, I guarantee to you, and this is a high conviction view, the Chinese Communist Party will not survive the next decade. Period. End of story, end of sentence. Why? Because there is a quid pro quo between the Chinese government and its people. We deliver to you a middle class lifestyle, you do not ask for a vote. And if that quid pro quo doesn't work out, well then they're going to ask for their vote. And there's this view out there, and many of my Chinese clients have it as well, it's not just a Western view. Uh, there's, there's a view that confusion culture, blah, 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 hierarchies, you know, respect for elders. No. False. Taiwan is culturally China. It is Chinese people who left after 1949 and they're a democracy. There's absolutely nothing different in China and other countries. They will ask for their vote if that quid pro quo is not satisfied. So this is what Chinese policymakers are focusing on, which is why they're so committed to resolving the inefficiencies in their capitalist system which is basically addicted to credit. They know that cheap credit is out, they, they understand the dollar is rising, the yields are going up, so they're actually trying to focus on this and they're go trying to clean up their financial system. Now, are they stimulating as they have done in the past? Not really. As you can see on the fiscal side, they're continuing to be pretty hawkish. So, stimulus in America, no stimulus in China. What is the consequence of this? Well, the consequence is that the US is outperforming the rest of the world. Um, and when America outperforms the rest of the world, so these two charts basically show you economic data, U.S. minus the rest of the world, U.S. minus the rest of the world economic surprise index, U.S. ISM manufacturing minus global PMI is the highest it has ever been on our series. America is roaring back, exactly like Trump said, and he's right. Relative to the rest of the world, the U.S. is massively outperforming, and that should lift the dollar over the next 6 to 12 months. So when you think about your global asset allocation decisions, given that you're a dollar-denominated investor as well, it's very important. If you invest abroad and you're dollar-denominated, the rest of the currencies go down. Even if you receive 7% in Brazil, what are you receiving? 7% of what? Of real-based assets? Ugh. And that's going to that's gonna hurt. So it depends. This is a very important point, and we think that over the next 6 to 12 months, uh, this will mean that actually U.S. assets will outperform international assets. Um, now, this is also, in a way, a little bit of a problem for U.S. assets as well. Because when the dollar appreciates, it hurts multinational corporations. It hurts the S&P 500. So there could be a moment when the dollar appreciates too much. We're not there yet, but it could happen when it impacts earnings of S&P 500 companies. Also, I like to think about America as having two central banks. There's the Federal Reserve which has already flagged to us that they're going to be hawkish this year. They're going to hike four times, not three. So the first central bank of America, the Federal Reserve, is hiking rates. The other central bank of America is the dollar. If the dollar appreciates, it is actually tightening monetary policy on its own. So if both central banks of America are tightening monetary policy, we could have a moment over the next six to 12 months when it starts impacting uh, domestic assets as well. In my view, this doesn't mean we're at the end of the bull market. It merely means 
that the Fed will have to back off from tightening at some point over the next 6 to 12 months. Whether it's Q4 of this year, where it's Q1 next year, the Fed will back off because the international risks will start showing up in the US through the dollar. This is very sim similar to the 1990s. Many of you might remember this. In 97, emerging markets started having some indigestion. Thailand, Thailand went belly up, then Indonesia, then South Korea, mainly the East Asian crisis. American Fed, American stock market were beating their chest. This doesn't matter. We're good. This is international problems. Then it went to Russia, then it went to Brazil. Then a hedge fund in the US blew up. And then in 1998, the Fed had to back off from tightening. Um, and that led to the silly season in 1999. Like that led to the overshoot in the market. And I think that's a good mental map for what's likely going to happen this time around, where the Fed eventually backs off over the next six to 12 months, leading to outperformance of equities, one final rally in this long bull market. But to get that, we first have to survive the summer. Uh, and now I'm gonna talk about whether we're gonna survive the summer or not. So are we gonna benefit from a silly market uh, from the sort of uh, last eight, 12, 18 months of a really great bull market. Well, we have to first survive this summer. And there's three risks I want to talk about over the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, the three risks are trade war, Iran, and Europe. So the things you actually came here for, you know. So I wanted to start off with something that I feel very passionate about, uh, the interplay of the two domestic political um, outlooks. But now we get to the fun stuff, which is uh, what's going on on the global front in terms of geopolitical risks. First and foremost, uh, globalization. In 2014, we wrote a piece that was titled The Apex of Globalization. And we argued that globalization was at an end. Now, this is before Trump. This is before Brexit. How do we make that call, structurally and theoretically? So this is a 200-year chart. And we have a trade globalization proxy. It's basically imports as percent of global GDP. We use it to illustrate that there were two moments when globalization, broadly defined, had a really good time, like a bull market in globalization. And as you can see, there's no way to really explain these two periods other than geopolitics. It's not like the period when globalization was suffering, we didn't have technological improvements. We've had technological innovation throughout this entire time. So it wasn't technology that made a difference. Um, it wasn't economic or financial innovation. The only way to explain these two upturns was geopolitics. There was Pax Britannica and Pax Americana. Empire. Empire is needed for globalization. Globalization is merely the rules and norms of behavior enforced by military force. That's it. That's all it is. And once there is no bully to enforce the rules and norms, well, then countries start deviating from those rules and norms. They start trying to kind of tinker at the margins, and then eventually they say, you know what, I'm going to change the rules and norms in my region. Well, that's not globalization, that's regionalization. And that's what happened to the United Kingdom in the 1880s. What happened in the 1880s? What big historical thing happened? Nothing. It's a trick question, so I just answered it. <laughs> Literally nothing happened in the 1880s. Nothing. But that's the point. There hadn't been a major war. For 20 years, the last two wars were Crimean and American Civil War in the 1860s, largely parochial, localized conflicts. There hadn't been a major war since Napoleonic Wars. What happened in the 1880s is that Britain ruled for almost a century, it created rules and norms, countries accepted it, eschewed conflict, said, yes, sir, you're in charge. I'm going to focus on making money. But once countries made money, what comes with money? Power. So by 1880s, Japan had opened up, right? Japan had opened up to the rest of the world, had 20 year run start. Russia had started industrialization after their disaster in the Crimea War. America, after the Civil War, was also industrializing and becoming more of a federal state rather than a confederation. Uh, and Germany had unified in 1971 and presented a massive challenge to British Empire. These were four massive changes in global politics, and they started to erode British empires on the margin. So we told our clients in 2014, look, we think globalization is at an end. We're going to ha start having trade wars. We're going to start having conflicts because of multipolarity. So that's, I, I want to start off with this, not because it's necessarily investment relevant. I mean, that's just the backdrop. But I want to point it out that if Donald Trump was replaced by someone else in 2020, folks, it's not going to be any different. You know, there's people out there saying like, oh, I wish Hillary Clinton had won. We wouldn't have a trade war. Are you sure about that? Remember what happened when Donald Trump 
sniffed out where the American median voter was. During the, uh, the primary, he was the only Republican who was anti-free trade, and he started gaining tra traction. What did Hillary Clinton do? Did she double down on her views of free trade? Did she defend NAFTA and TPP, which she literally wrote herself? No, she said, no, 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 when I wrote it was good, but then other people came along and they mucked it up. So now I'm against it. So no, it's going to be the opposite. Policymakers in America are going to double down on protectionism. Donald Trump is just mean about it. You know, he just has a style that rubs off people wrong. But next president of the United States might be more eloquent, might be nicer, but they're going to be as protectionist, if not more. Um, and that comes down to the issue of constraints. Are there actual constraints constraining the American president from being protectionist? Or are there actual constraints today that are preventing the American president from being actually pro-free trade? So let's start with the American voter, with this myth that investment banks try to tell my clients that there's going to be a revolt amongst the public against um, protectionist policies, that you know, the farmers, the soybean farmers, and the Walmart shoppers are going to come together and, and, and change the mind of President Trump. Well, first of all, let's look at the data. So this is poll data from 2014, by the way, before Trump even sniffed this out. Americans on this table, when Americans are asked whether trade raises wages and trade creates jobs, only about 20% of Americans agree with this statement. That's less than French people. Now I say that because French people are famously anti-globalization. There's this guy, José Bové, who famously takes his tractor, he's a farmer, and rams them into McDonald's, right? He really, really hates McDonald's. Um, so poor McDonald's has had to like, you know, jump through hoops in France, like, no, no, it's local cheese, you know? <laughs> like, so, and I mean, look at China. China, 70%, Brazil, South Korea, Spain, UK, Germany, Mexico, 40% of Mexicans, double the number of Americans. The Mexicans are about to elect the most left-wing president of Mexico since the 1920s, and even he is fully on board with free trade. So Americans have lost faith in free trade. So I completely reject the notion, completely, high conviction view, that anyone was going to revolt. In fact, this reveals to you a very important method that we use, which is this political science theory of the median voter. Median voter is a theoretical construct. That person does not exist. But on every issue, there is one. And median voter is the price maker in the political marketplace. Policymakers are price takers. Why does that matter? It matters because when Donald Trump reveals the preference of the median voter, and he did so successfully by winning both the Republican primary, where he was uh, arrayed against a number of free trade traditional Republicans, and when he then wins the election against Hillary Clinton, he has revealed the preference of that median voter. So what is now happening in the American Congress, for example? American legislators Congresswomen and congressmen are falling over themselves to prove to the median voter they too are protectionist. So if you're liberal and you don't like this, Google Elizabeth Warren's speech in Beijing. She made it two months ago, and I mean she made Trump sound like Bill Clinton. She was extremely opposed to free trade. I mean she was giving the Chinese the business in Beijing. She went to Beijing, gave a speech extremely anti-free trade. Um, in Congress, in the Senate uh, last Monday, Senate passed a defense authorization bill, you know, where they fund the U.S. military. Eighty-five senators voted in favor of it. There were two amendments attached to this bill. One was to uh, beef up the Committee for Foreign Investment in the U.S., the CFIUS process, which checks inbound investment in the U.S. for national security threats. They have now made it more likely to prevent Chinese investment in the U.S. The second amendment, Congress, again, sorry, Senate, with 85 bipartisan majority, told President Trump he cannot resolve the ZTE um, sanctions. The ZTE is a uh, Chinese company, telecommunication company, that has been accused of skirting Iranian and North Korean sanctions. Trump basically threatened to put him out of business, and then he made a side deal with President Xi on it, and Congress just told him, nope, you can't make a deal. We want ZTE to fail. So both Republicans and Democrats are falling over themselves to prove their credentials, their mercantilist protections credentials. This tells you that this is here to stay. There's not going to be sort of a pushback against protectionism against China, and that's why trade war risks are very high. 
The other risk, of course, as I mentioned earlier, for all you uh, lawyers in the room, very important point, the Constitution of the United States gives the Congress the prerogative over foreign policy and national security. However, the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, the Trade Act of 1974, and the International Emergency Economic Powers Act of 1977 have given up that power. Now, what's interesting about this table is we published it in 2016. I haven't modified it at all. It's the same table. We told our clients in 2016, based on just reading, <laughs> not some secret White House sources, just reading laws, the U.S. president can do whatever the hell he wants. Okay, this is a fact. There's nothing Congress can do about this. And then economic constraints don't exist because the U.S. doesn't really trade. It's a very closed economy. The U.S. can withstand a trade war much longer than anyone else can. So politically, constitutionally, legally, and economically, there's really no constraints to President Trump being really mean to China. And finally, the last point is that nobody else is going to prevent him from doing this either. The deep state, the swamp, the Defense Department and the Intelligence Department, what are they going to do? They're going to prevent him from being nice to China as well. Because there's another factor here that's very important. The trade war is not just about the market access in China or intellectual property rights. It's also based on the fact that China is now a peer competitor. This here is a millennial chart. So it goes back a thousand years. You know, take it with a massive grain of salt. The reason I have it here is because it's a favorite chart of my Chinese clients. About twice a year I get this chart sent to me, you know, by Chinese clients. And they're like, ha ha ha, we're back. Mean reversion. You know, look, we were here and now we're here. So the red is China. You know, this is an anomaly. That's an anomaly. This is reality. And our own geopolitical power index, which we've constructed using a different index made in the 1960s during the Cold War uh, by political scientists in the US, we've adjusted it for the 21st century, shows the same thing. There's the US. This is empirical, quantitative measure of American power. It's in a decline. There's China. And then, what are Chinese doing with that power? Well, on the left side, this is just uh, a map of their nine dash line. Nine dash line, if you haven't heard about it, is just nine dashes on a map. But what these nine dashes stand for is the Chinese are claiming all of this as their sovereign territory. Now this extends down to Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, and Thailand, and Philippines. So the Chinese are not saying they have exclusive fishing rights here, or economic rights. They're saying this is our sovereign territory, the way New Hampshire is the sovereign territory of the United States of America. So when they issue the new Chinese passports, they have the outline of the map of China, and then whoop, this thing here. So they've built runways on man-made islands. They put missiles on them. So that's what they're doing. They feel emboldened. They're right. Empirically speaking, the US is in a decline, still the most powerful country in the world. But American responsibilities are global. So America has several navies, one in North Atlantic, one in the Mediterranean, one in the Persian Gulf, lots in East Asia. What do the Chinese have? They're only focused on this. It's like a small college team playing on home court, rabid fans. This is their home court. So yes, they could win a war here against the American Navy here. Against America globally? No. But here? Yes. So, What's really happening here is the American policymakers are waking up to this fact that the Chinese appear competitor. And this chart really shows why everybody kind of missed it. It took the United States 160 years to reach this level of Chinese wealth. So from 1800 to 1961. Japan, it took them 80 years. China, it took 20 years. Boom. And so now people are waking up. So this is very important because when Trump is mean to Canada and poor Justin Trudeau, when Trump is mean to Germany, the intelligence and defense community are going to walk into the Oval Office and say, look, you know, they're allies. Don't be so hard on them. You know, maybe just focus on steel and aluminum tariffs. But when it comes to China, they're going to walk into his Oval Office if he makes a deal. And they're going to say, hell no, you're not making a deal. And by the way, this is exactly what happened. So I've been giving this very alarmist view on global trade. Uh, for the past 18 months. And so most of my clients have said, Marco, but go back to their Mar-a-Lago summit and the chocolate cake. Right? I mean, they're going to make a deal. Xi Jinping and Donald Trump, they're going to sit down and Xi Jinping will say, you know what, I'll buy more beef, I'll buy more oil, I'll buy some more Boeings, and boom, he's got to win, he's going to take it to the midterm elections. And I've been pushing against this 
view for a very long time. And then a month ago, I'm sitting there, I'm sitting, sipping my coffee in front of the Sunday talk shows, and there's Kudlow and Mnuchin, and they're talking about a trade truce. This was right ahead of Mar uh, May 21st. May 21st was an important date because that's when that $50 billion worth of trade was going to be tariffed. And they're like, nah, we made a deal. Chinese have committed to buy more beef and boinks. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm dousing myself in gasoline because every one of my clients is emailing me like, ah, gotcha. yeah, where's your view now? You know, there it is, the chocolate cake, it happened. Well, it didn't. Three days later, that deal was dead. Why? Because the Oval Office door closed. Somebody walked in and said, hey, President Trump, are we Nigeria? Do we look like Nigeria? Have you sold us as if we're a commodity producer to the Chinese? Hell no, this is about semiconductors. This is about high tech, this is about IP theft. This is about geopolitical conflict. No deal. So boom, there comes the Twitter, and he says, no, the deal is terrible. Even though two days earlier he said that the, the, the deal is great for American farmers. Suddenly there's a 180 degree reversal. So the constraints on President Trump are actually working the other way. It's very difficult to see how this doesn't become investment relevant, and of course, what we did get is eventually they did put tariffs, the U.S. did put tariffs of $50 billion, and by June 30th, which is this weekend, we're supposed to have the tariffs imposed on $200 billion worth of trade. Now yesterday Trump did back off a little bit from imposing investment restrictions based on the 1977 International Emer Economic Emergency Powers Act, so he did not do that. He did not restrict investment by China through executive order. He's going to let Congress do that through that CFIUS process I mentioned. However, I do expect that there will be tariffs in 200 billion. What's China going to do to retaliate? It's going to continue to downshift renminbi. There was basically a consensus, by the way, uh, in early 2016. Central banks got together in Shanghai at the G20. It's the Plaza Accord 2.0, basically, and they allowed the dollar to start depreciating. And what we're worried about is that that's going to start unwinding. Why? Well, because Trump is, you know, being mean to everyone. So how are other countries going to oppose the US? They can't oppose through tariffs. That's very difficult to do because America imports so much and doesn't really export as much. So what they're going to do is they're going to try to play currency politics. And that's very important because if the ECB and Europe steps back from being hawkish, if China steps back and allows the renminbi to depreciate, that's going to even push the dollar up. My dollar bullish view is based on fundamentals, not conspiracy, but there's a conspiracy if you want one. <laughs> You know, there's a conspiratorial element to it as well. That's how other countries are going to try to punish us. By saying, oh, you're going to put tariffs of 10%? We're going to depreciate by 10%. Net-net, our goods are still the same price. Okay, so that's trade wars. The other issue that I worry about is Iran. And here I'm going to probably lose the whole crowd because I'm going to make everyone in this room angry at me. You know? So first of all, we got to give Trump props on North Korea, okay? The media, I mean, that's crazy. The man got Kim Jong-un to give him something. This is complete false that Trump did not get anything out of this deal. He did. He got him to freeze ballistic missile testing. He got him to freeze nuclear uh, testing. He got him to free American prisoners that were held, you know, for political reasons. And he got Kim Jong-un to stop talking about wreathing American cities in flames. Now, obviously, this is the beginning of negotiations. Negotiations can last two to three years. President Obama negotiated with Iran between 2012 and 2015. It took three years. Uh, but the reason that Trump ultimately got what he wanted on North Korea is because he pressured them through, uh, through bullying. Or, as we say in political science, through establishing a credible threat of war, which is very, very important and has been very difficult for any American policymaker to do in North Korea for a number of reasons. Trump did it because he's not, you know, a regular American president. And we know this quantitatively because what he did is he spooked China that there was going to be a war. He actually convinced China that he was crazy enough to go to war with North Korea. Damn the consequences. So we showed our clients this chart back when it looked like this. And we told them, watch this chart. This is basically exports to North Korea from China, which continue to be the same. China continues to export to North Korea capital goods that North Korea needs to run their economy. But look at imports from North Korea. They've collapsed. China has stopped buying stuff from North Korea. Why does that matter? Because they're starving them from hard currency. Without this trade, China, North Korea no longer has hard currency to buy goods like oil from Russian smugglers out of Vladivostok 
and other basic necessities. Trump won this issue. He did it correctly by applying what he calls maximum pressure policy. This is a tactic of basically, you know, carrying a big stick and tweeting wildly. So it's good for humanity what Trump did. He deserves a Nobel Prize for this. Now, as I said, a lot of you are not going to like this. But also, a lot of you are not going to like the next point. <laughs> which is that if he applies this strategy to Iran, that's very bad for humanity. <laughs> because Iran is not North Korea. You see, in March of 2017, we identified what he was doing with North Korea and told our clients it was going to be good. I got a lot of head mail from the coasts. A lot of my clients on the coast were like, what are you talking about? He's crazy. He's going to take us to war. No, he's not. North Korea is a paper tiger. They have two gears, park and apocalypse. If they go to apocalypse, <laughs> their regime is over. So yeah, bully them. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. The problem with Iran is that they're not a paper tiger. They've got a lot of levers. And one of the big, I think, um, misconceptions about the deal that Barack Obama made with Iran is that it was void of strategic logic. It was actually extremely strategic. So you can see on this chart, this shows you foreign deployment of troops, American troops in Middle East and East Asia. The gray is the negotiations with Iran. What the Iran deal allowed the U.S. to do is to go from 250,000 men and women under arms in the Middle East to 30,000. It gave America strategic maneuvering room to pivot to Asia. That was why the U.S. made a deal with Iran. Now, in making that deal, the U.S. gave some stuff up. It allowed Iran to retain its influence in Yemen, Syria, and Lebanon. You know why? Because those three countries do not matter one bit to the United States of America. It was a cold, calculated, real politic, Kissingerian move by the Obama administration. Now, did Obama then follow through and actually pivot to Asia? No. That's why we got the problems in South China Sea. But okay, let's leave that aside. The bottom line is that the point of this deal was to open up maneuvering room for the US. Now, did Iran actually give anything up? Well, as I said, their influence in, in Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen actually increased. However, what Iran did do is something that does matter to the US. First and foremost, it stopped threatening the Straits of Hormuz, the choke point through which 18 million barrels of oil transit every day. They used to threaten the Straits of Hormuz pretty much every week in 2011, 2012. If the Straits of Hormuz was ever closed, as this chart shows, it will be three times greater than any other supply loss in human history for oil. This is huge. Two, Saudi Arabia. All oil is produced and refined in something called the Eastern Province. Eastern Province of Saudi Arabia is majority Shia. So is Bahrain, the tiny kingdom where the US Fifth Fleet is based. Both of them are ruled by Sunni monarchies. In 2011, when the Arab Spring started, what did Iran, a Shia power, do? It incited revolution in both of those areas, which is why Saudi Arabia invaded Bahrain and why it had to suppress protests in the Eastern Province. So another thing that Iran gave the US is it said, OK, fine, we're not going to threaten these two critical places for you. Finally, in Iraq, Iran acquiesced in 2014 to the removal of Nouri al-Maliki, a complete puppet, prime minister of Iraq, who was a puppet of the Iranian regime, extremely sectarian man, who probably created the Islamic State, in a way, by repressing the Sunnis so much. So they revolted and eventually went to the arms of these jihadi sort of, you know, militants. And finally, and I think most importantly, in 2013, Iranian Guardianship Council, which is basically a number of uh, you know, religious scholars, decided to allow Hosni Rouhani, the current president of Iran, to run. So when Rouhani won in 2013, he was allowed to win. Thus changing domestic politics in Iran and giving uh, Iran a face that was more moderate towards the West, and most importantly, stop threatening Israel's existence every Tuesday, as the previous president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, did uh, very vocally, right, and publicly. So these are the things that Iran did. And finally, of course, it helped the U.S. military deal with Islamic State. So IS Islamic State control in 2015 was blue. Uh, in March of this year, it's red. It's even smaller now. As you can see, they extended all the way to Baghdad. In 2014, in August, there was a battle of Baghdad where American Air Force, the A-10 Warthogs, which are probably the most advanced still to this day, um, ground support aircraft, were literally talking with Iranian troops outside of Baghdad. 
They were supporting an Iranian efforts to defend Baghdad against the Islamic State. So when you hear this idea that, oh, this deal allowed Iran to dominate uh, the Middle East, yeah, to an extent, yes, in areas where America has zero interest. But when it comes to areas where America has interest, the Iran deal uh, actually removed Iranian power. Which is why when we put a, together a decision tree of what's going to happen, we worry that Iran could start reactivating some of these levers it gave up. Which is why our probability, our conditional probability of the sort of a nightmare scenario where the U.S. ultimately has to attack Iran is at 20%. Last year with North Korea, it was 5%. So again, maximum pressure doctrine applied to Iran is going to be a problem and we think is going to add you know, supply risks to already tight oil markets. So you've heard that OPEC has decided to increase um, production. It's in the news, oil prices actually reacting by, um, by rallying. Why? Because OPEC doesn't have enough supply to overcome. Combination of all the supply risks that are in the market. And that's not counting my nightmare scenario that Iran retaliates through civil war in Iraq. If there's a civil war in Iraq, I mean, we could lose two million barrels like that. And that would be really critical. So we think there's more upside risk to oil prices despite a dollar bullish environment which tends to be bad for oil prices. Okay, final risk is Europe. Uh, I'm going to skip through some stuff so we have a little bit of time for uh, Q&A. Europe, I think, is largely a red herring for investors. In our view, and we've had this view for a very long time, it's a high conviction view, Europe will remain together. Not because they like each other, not because they think the euro is a success story, but because leaving the euro area would mean that a lot of folks in Europe would have their assets re-denominated into monopoly money. So as I said last night, imagine if uh, your clients, the clients of Harvest, uh, you know, had to deal with uh, New Hampshire independence. And imagine if New Hampshire decided to have a New Hampshire dollar. So you wake up one day and all your US dollar assets where you have invested in a global reserve currency that everyone on the planet wants, whether you're a Russian oligarch or an Arab sheikh, you want those dollars, you suddenly re-denominate your assets into a New Hampshire dollar. You know, like, I mean, I love New Hampshire, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but that would be a problem. Now, a lot of, a lot of folks in, the Euro in Europe have realized this. So yes, are populists winning in Europe? Absolutely. Look at this chart. Boom. This is seats held by non-centrist parties as percent of total seats. Pew. Populists are winning. However, support for the euro, very messy chart, very messy chart, but what it's showing is that since 2013, when it bottomed, support for the euro has actually increased. The euro area-wide support is about 70%. You can't get people to agree at 70% that babies are cute, right? But in Europe, they've, they've agreed they support the euro. So how do you explain these two charts? Well, populists, which are winning seats, are focusing on other issues, like immigration. And yeah, it's in the news and people are really passionate about it in Europe, just like they are in the US. But to you as an investor sitting in New Hampshire, you don't care if Europeans get a little bit more anti-immigrant. You just care that they don't take your assets, you've sunk into Europe and redenominated into drachmas or liras or pesetas. That's what you care about. And that's not a risk. And this goes back to my point about constraints. It goes back to the point about constraints. A lot of policymakers in Europe are going to shake their little fist against Brussels and Berlin and want a little bit better conditions, like the Greeks did. And so from a lot of investors sitting outside of Europe, they're looking at the situation, they're saying, oh my god, this is really, really threatening. This is like the game of chicken in, in a game theoretical sense. So I want to explain to you how this works. And by the way, this is also an insight into how we do our analysis. A game of chicken is the most serious game because the probability of the worst outcome, which is where both cars hit each other, is actually very high. Now, a game of chicken comes from, if you've seen a James Dean movie, you know, two young men fighting for the heart of a young lass or driving their muscle cars into one another. Whoever swerves is like weak and loses, right? Okay. <laughs> now, the reason that this is a problem is that if you assume full rationality, if you assume full rationality of your opponent, what are you going to assume? they're going to swerve. So you're going to keep driving. Which is why this bottom right quadrant where the player A and player B both drive straight actually has a much higher probability. So throughout the Euro area crisis, my clients keep telling me, Marco, this can get really, really ugly. Like you don't know what's going to happen. You can't predict. You've got to be cautious. False. Absolutely false. 
We can make a forecast. Why? Because not everybody is driving a muscle car. Okay, so in 2015, we argued with a high conviction view that Angela Merkel was driving a G-Class Mercedes-Benz. I don't know if you know what those look like. I don't know how many Russian oligarch uh, folks you have in New Hampshire. <laughs> but they are sort of the square looking, you know, beefy. They're called G-Wagons. Very, very scary looking car, about two and a half tons. What was Alexis Tsipras, the prime minister of Greece, driving? He was riding a tricycle. <laughs> so the bottom right quadrant is suddenly a lot different. For Angela Merkel, if she hits that tricycle, she's got to take her G-Wagon into the body paint shop. For Tsipras, it means death. Which is why in 2015, at the height of this Greek crisis, we had a very high conviction view that nothing bad was going to happen. Similarly, this time around with Italy, we have a pretty much similar view. However, it doesn't mean that over the next six months, Italy can't produce market turbulence. In fact, market turbulence is required in order to discipline policymakers in Italy uh, to understand what it is that they're driving. Are they driving a tricycle? You know what? I'll give them a little bit more credit. They are driving a vehicle. But it's like a finely tuned, finely crafted Lamborghini that weighs, you know, 300 kilograms. They're still going to get crushed by that G-Wagon. So eventually they're going to have to swerve as well. So I'm going to stop here. In terms of investment implications, I'm going to leave them out here on the final panel. Basically, the dollar, we still think there's more upside. It's a momentum currency, as empirics show. So it tends to overshoot and undershoot. Right now it's going up. Emerging markets are in trouble. I think there's more downside ahead. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest in emerging markets. Just means you should be very thorough about how you think about it. So we're very bullish on oil. So you should be in EM producers of oil. Overweight developed markets over EM. Within DM, we're actually overweight Europe versus high beta places like Europe and Japan. Within EM, favor energy producers. Expect more volatility this summer, including more downside in absolute terms. And overall, I think we're officially in a trade war, or will be by the end of this weekend. So I would favor small caps over large caps going forward. And I think Iran, US tensions are a massive risk to global uh, oil supply. So I'm going to end here. And if there's any questions, obviously I can answer them. There's a lot of things we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about Russia. We didn't talk about income inequality. We didn't talk about all sorts of things. So feel free to uh, ask anything that I didn't address. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marco, one question. You didn't really talk about this until the very end. You, you said that volatility often disciplines policymakers. And uh, <coughs> one of your slides suggested that interest rates are likely to keep climbing from Federal Reserve policy perspective. You've got the dollar strengthening. And the combination of those eventually causes problems. Mm. And do you expect the financial markets to sniff out the ultimate likelihood of higher interest rates and a stronger dollar causing problems for our economy and causing some degree of or meaningful degree of volatility in the financial markets and that existing until the Fed blinks or swerves. Right, so I think the great uh, model for this is the 90s, as I said. 97, the Fed was very bullish, hawkish. It was raising interest rates. Started causing problems in the rest of the world. No one really noticed it. The dollar started rising, and it had eventually forced the Fed to blink in 98. So I think a very similar situation will happen here, where the, uh, the, the two central banks are tightening, un unaware or uncaring of what happens in the rest of the world. So you had uh, Federal Reserve Chair Powell. He was in Sintra in Portugal. And he said, we don't care. We're going to keep rising uh, rates. Um, he was very, very hawkish. And I think eventually that kind of you know, um, bullish rhetoric could be reversed, as it has been in the past. So uh, I do think eventually the Fed will uh, blink. That would be my view. And I think that that will cause the last stage of the bull market, which tends to always be like silly time. Uh, 1999 is what I'm basically talking about, where you know, all the fundamentals don't necessarily make sense. The valuations get out of whack. But you don't want to be sitting on the sidelines because you're missing potentially 20% of upside at that late stage of the bull market. And I think that's going to come, but it, that scenario almost requires the volatility. This is the irony. This is why you have to, as an investor, think in time frames. If you're not bearish for the next six months, 
then you can't be bullish for the next 24 months. Let me say it again. If you're not bearish for the next six months and the Fed doesn't blink and everything is fine, I'm wrong, we're at 2,900 by August, September, well then it's going to end next year because the Fed's going to be like, okay, we're going to raise rates eight times over the next two years. Boom, you have a recession 2019. But if my scenario is right and a lot of these risks start being priced in by the market, the Fed backs off, then I think you extend that bull market into 2020 past the election and maybe the recession is not even in 2020. Maybe it happens in 2021. It prolongs the cycle. Do you think there's any risk of China uh, just stopping buying U.S. bonds in retaliation? So great question. Will China stop buying U.S. bonds in retaliation? So what they're actually doing is they're allowing renminbi to depreciate, which means they're actually buying U.S. bonds. If they sold U.S. bonds, what that would do, uh, it, was, it would actually depreciate the dollar. And, you know, American policymakers will be like, thanks. <laughs> so it doesn't help them to do that. Now, that's a lot. Uh, it's always in the news. It's like, when will they do that? I, right now, they're basically managing the currency by buying U.S. Treasuries because they want to, sh to appreciate the dollar, depreciate renminbi, and tell Trump, listen, you can jack up tariffs, 20% tariff, by the way. Half of that is taken by the firm normally into the profit margin. Half of that is translated to the consumer. So it's about half of the tariff is translated to consumer. So that's a 10% increase in the cost of a Chinese toy. But if Remimbi falls down 10%, then what's the price of the toy? Exactly the same. So that's what they're doing right now. And they're d one of the ways they accomplish that is by buying treasuries. So they're actually doing the exact opposite. They're very, very, very smart. Yes, sir. Every day I've been talking a little bit about Russia. Where are you okay. seeing that, uh, particularly with the increasing oil price that after yeah. it helps them? Yeah, absolutely. So we're actually, we think uh, Russia is a trade, not an investment. So we like Russia from an investment perspective, very cheap. As I said, I'm bearish in emerging markets, but I, I do like certain places. Russia is one of them. The other issue is that, you know, Putin just won the re-election. Uh, he seems to be willing to kind of step back. He's going to have a meeting with Trump, which is super positive. Trump got really, really uh, aggressive earlier this year, then backed off from some of the sanctions. Uh, and in our uh, estimate, Russia doesn't really have... Um, any other sort of geopolitical issue to poke. In fact, the only reason Russia's in Syria is to distract from their failures in Ukraine. Let me say that again. Syria is a distraction. What failures in Ukraine, you might say? Well, they got Crimea. Yes, that was a success. Didn't take much uh, of a military action because Crimeans are extremely pro-Russian. They are Russian. Uh, but Eastern Ukraine was a total disaster for Russia. I mean, you're talking about three oblasts of Ukraine, Donetsk, Luhansk, and Kharkiv. Kharkiv, which is Russian-speaking, Russian, didn't even revolt. They were like, no, we don't want to join Russia. Mm -mm. Donetsk and Luhansk has had a revolt, but this Russian-backed uh, uh, insurgency only conquered about a third, a quarter of the territory. That's nuts. They had a complete military disaster in eastern Ukraine. No one's talking about it. They got spanked by one of the worst trained and worst supplied militaries in the world, the Ukrainians. And so what did, Trump, uh, what did uh, Putin do? Putin basically said, oh, we're, don't worry about Ukraine anymore. We're going to go fight terrorists in Syria and defend Christendom. So the Syrian intervention was not some deep strategic logic by President Putin. That really was just a distraction because for two years they had been telling their voters, their viewers on Russian state TV, that there were Nazis in Kiev, Nazis, and that those Nazis were going to go and ethnically cleanse Russians you know, in Ukraine. So they had to suddenly shift from that to like, oh, we don't care about Ukraine, everything's fine. They went to Syria. So uh, obviously in Syria, he had a lot of success. I always joke, Putin has a very high geopolitical ROI. You know, very small investment, high return on investment, good for him. Uh, but there's, there wasn't like a deeper strategic logic here. Syria is actually completely useless for Russia. Uh, they have a port in Syria, which would be great if they had a navy. <laughs> The Russian, the Russian uh, aircraft carrier, Admiral Kuznetsov, requires three tugs to drag it through the Gibraltar into Syrian port. I mean, this is, I mean, the, the Greek Navy would sink the entire Russian Black Sea fleet in a day. The Greek Navy. So, the, you know, there's a lot of chess beating out there. We're kind of eating that propaganda here, too. We bought it, basically, that Putin is this big threat. Um, I don't think so. Uh, and I think that that's good because the, the market is cheap. 
He's not going to do anything silly. He's actually looking forward to this meeting with Trump more than vice versa. Um, and he's hoping that some of the allies in Europe, like the new Italian government, remove the sanctions on Russia, which would be super positive for the Russian market. And by the way, Russia is an interesting uh, uh, case too, because in 2014 they suffered a huge collapse of oil prices. And the Russian Central Bank and Finance Ministry actually did something fascinating. They were the most orthodox, most conservative monetary and fiscal policy authorities in the world. They allowed the ruble to collapse, they tightened fiscal policy, they actually did a lot of painful things, and Putin managed to do that by blaming Obama and Merkel for the pain, because that's when the sanctions were applied. So, you know, um, they're really focused on reforming the economy now and making sure that, you know, the people are happy. Uh, and that's good for us as investors because it means they're not going to go and invade anyone else. And that means that there's an upside <laughs> in their market, to put it bluntly. Yes, sir. Yeah, passing reference to income inequality yeah. in the US. What are the trends and what are those trends portend? Well, it is the widest it's been since 1920s. And so, um, um, you know, I think the trend portends that the median voter, the median voter who sets, you know, makes the policy, is moving to the left on economic matters. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, and also for the camera. So great question. The question is, you made a passing reference to income inequality. I really mentioned it as an issue I didn't talk about. Uh, and so what does it mean for US policy and politics and for the markets? And I think what it means is that we're going to have more left-leaning economic policies. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to have Democrats win. This is the interesting thing. So as I, I started off the conversation by saying that early, in 1980s, the Reagan-Thatcher reforms won. The median voter moved to the right on economic policy. So what happened with left-leaning policymakers? They moved right on economic policy. Now, did they move right on social or, or uh, other policy? No. They stayed left on those issues. So you could be a liberal, but also be in favor of free markets and, and right-wing conservative fiscal policy and deregulation. And that's what Bill Clinton was. That's what Tony Blair was. That's what Gerhard Schroeder was. So uh, that was the 90s. <laughs> That's why nobody cared about politics. Because nobody cared about election. Who wins the uh, UK election? Labor versus Tories. Who cares? They're all going to do the same thing as far as I, as an, as an investor, care. Today, it's going to be the exact opposite, where you can have conservative, socially conservative Republicans. You know, they're pro-gun rights, anti-abortion. But on economic policies, they're going to be pretty dirigist, as we call it. Not laissez-faire. Not, you know, free markets, but more states should intervene. I mean, that's what Trump is. Now, to his credit, he's deregulated a lot, like a traditional Republican would, which is very positive for investors. He's deregulated policy. He's removed the regulatory burden of the Obama years. But he's also interfering heavily in U.S. corporations. He's telling Harley Davidson what they can and cannot do. It's not very Republican of him. Now, you might agree with it because it's good for the median voter, but that's what income inequality is doing. It's pulling policymakers away from um, the consensus on free markets and laissez-faire capitalism. And I think that we're going to move away from that in the US, which means profit margins over the long term are going to come down. Basically, if I showed you a chart of profit margins and the share of, of national income going to labor, they're at the extreme. And that chart is pure mean reversion. It is politically no longer feasible to have profit margins go up and the share of labor go down. And that's going to narrow itself down. It doesn't mean Democrats win. Again, it means everybody moves to the left on economic policy. And that's a very high conviction view. Now, what happens in 2020? You know, well, in 2020, we could have a situation where during the election, the Democratic candidate is a younger, more appealing, more electable version of Bernie Sanders. I mean, that could be the outcome where you have Bernie Sanders 2.0 versus Trump. And I think that that person could wipe the floor with Donald Trump. In fact, I would argue that if Bernie Sanders had won the primary, he would have won the election. He was actually polling better against Trump than Hillary Clinton was. And uh, same thing in other countries, like the United Kingdom. The main sort of source of, uh, of our free markets, you know, where Margaret Thatcher revolution started in the, 19, in the late 1970s. Um, who is the leader of the opposition in the United Kingdom? It's a gentleman by the name of Jeremy Corbyn. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, in 2014, um, was a guest of Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela, on his weekly radio show. 
So Jeremy Corbyn is more left-wing than any policymaker in the Western world since probably Francois Mitterrand, but even more left-wing than that. And this is the United Kingdom. This is the bastion of free market capitalism. So that's the implication. We're going left. This is a fact. Taxes are going up. This tax cut that just happened is going to be reversed. And there's going to be more regulation. And profit margins of multinational corporations are going to come down. Uh, there's no way to move against that. So if you're an accountant or a tax lawyer, you're in, you're in the money, guys. Okay? <laughs> you guys are going to do really, really well. And if you're a geopolitical strategist or a comedian <laughs> or both, you're going to be fine. Marco, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks a lot.